Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. On a quarter after midnight on July 30th, 1945, the USS Indianapolis, a Portland-class heavy cruiser with 10 battle stars for her service, was hit by two torpedoes from a Japanese submarine. Twelve minutes later, the ship was lost to the depths not far from the Marianas Trench, taking some 300 of its 1,195 crew members with it. The remainder were strewn about an area in the ocean hundreds of yards wide, and for four days they floated in a mixture of open sea salt water and diesel oil, in the blazing tropical sun during the day and in the blistering cold of the ocean at night, constantly wet, bobbing in 12-foot swells, their skin breaking down layer by layer in the chemical mixture. Over the four days before they were spotted by an American pilot, they lost more than 300 more to dehydration, salt poisoning, suicide, succumbing to injuries sustained in the sinking, and shark attacks. Among the survivors, and one of only 13 still alive today, was our guest Harold Bray. It was his first voyage as a sailor and his last. And it was a defining event in American history, in World War II, and in his life. We love him for his sacrifice to our country and for his dedicated service to our community. And we think you'll love him too. He's our special guest today, Harold Bray. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mitchell Left. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. My name is Harold Bray, and this is the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Harold Bray is an American treasure, and we have him right here in Benicia, California. Uh, he's hosting us at his house. Harold is a survivor of the USS Indianapolis. And for our listeners, if you don't know the story about the Indianapolis, uh, it left here with Harold Bray on it after amassing 10, 10 battle stars including the Battle of Guam, uh, for which I'm thankful because I'm from Guam. When you got on it, you got on it here in Mare Island. Mare Island, yeah. And you were on your way, uh, underway from here on your way to Tinian well, to drop well, we, off. Well, we went Mare Island to, to San Francisco, okay. and we picked up whatever it was. We didn't know what whatever it was. Whatever it was. And then we made the high-speed run to Pearl, it still uh, is stands that record stands today seventy four hours to a Pearl from Hunters Point to Pearl Harbor, yeah, seventy four hours, and then from Pearl Harbor went to Tinian where we dropped off the package. You were saying that as that boat was this is a giant ship yeah. and you, the back end is just dug in and you were getting yeah. it. We going were taking f- water over the fantail. Yeah, we were, we were doing about well they say thirty four thirty five knots. Yeah. So that's Pushing a lot of water. Almost 40 miles an hour. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. The ship that big going that fast. And it, the, well, we couldn't use the after chow hall because the water was coming over the fan tail. <laughs> How much fuel does that take? I mean, that must burn a lot of fuel going that fast. How much what? Fuel. Oh, I don't know. But uh, I don't know what we were burning, but it, it took a lot of fuel. We took on more fuel than... Uh, Guam, I think uh, we before we went left Guam. We, I think they fueled up there. I'm not sure. Either that or Tinian, we got more. We made a stop at Pearl, but that was just to. We carried 200 passengers from Mare Island, to, from guys going being dispersed out in the South Pacific, but we dumped them off at Pearl Harbor, and then we took off from there. Just to give our listeners some context, from here to Pearl Harbor is about 2,800 miles here from here? the west coast of, of, of uh, the it's United about States. 2,400, yeah. About 2,400. Yeah. And, then so from, uh, and then from Pearl Harbor to Guam is probably about 4,400. Yeah, it took another day, I think. I can't sure. remember. And Guam and Tinian are maybe 250 miles apart. Yeah. It's worth noting that the package to which you referred yeah. was the atomic bomb. It was a, that was it, yeah. We didn't know that, though. Yeah. We okay. didn't know it until we were in a hospital in the Philippines. Then they told us, well, 
We got picked up on the 5th of August. Well, let's back up because you skipped a bunch of stuff there. Uh, <laughs> we went from you're leaving Tinian and uh, on your way out of Tinian. Yeah, we uh, dumped the, the, whatever, the package off at of Tinian. Right. Then we went to Guam and the skipper went ashore to get orders. And, uh, and beer. He asked for an <laughs> escort and he said, you don't need one. So you were refused an escort on yeah, Guam. Right. Wow. Uh, and uh, he said, there, well, the people at Guam said, uh, there's no action here for a long time. There's, there's nobody, no Japs around. So. Got quiet since but, Liberation Day. But there was a ship sunk two days before that. The Underhill was uh, a Liberty ship got sunk just outside of Guam that just a couple of days before that. Dude, nobody wanted to tell you about that. No, no, no. So you didn't need an escort, or so no. they thought? No, we left Guam, and uh, that's when this, it was so warm. And we had no air conditioning in the ship, so the skipper let us sleep where we could find a spot. My uh, bunk was down three decks, three decks next to uh, sick bay, which... It was pretty hot down there, so I chose to uh, sleep up on up on number number two turret. You could see mm-hmm. number two, the eight inch turret there. Okay. I got up on the ledge and uh, underneath that, and a pillow and a blanket, and uh, and I got in the about about midnight, and. Uh, so you're you're up topside, but you found yourself yeah, some shade. Yeah. This one right here? <laughs> right there, that one, yeah. And the first torpedo hit right under me on this side and rolled me off the, the deck. I fell about 10 feet mm. to the next deck, and I went to get my shoes, and they went over the side. So I got down on the quarter deck, and by that time, she was listening pretty bad. And there was guys laying all over the place, and screaming and hollering and and uh so i thought i uh i made my way aft through the uh port hangar and there was somebody in there throwing life jackets out so i grabbed the life jacket and went aft some more aft to the bulkhead uh, but the torpedo hit so if you had been in your bunk you would have been done for i would have i would have made it everybody got killed up forward uh, the Marines, and we were segregated in those days. We had blacks and Filipinos all set forward. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, the Marines, we carried 37 Marines on board, too. Okay. And uh, don't ask me why, because, you know, they're just guards. Anyhow, they didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's 37 we, of them. <laughs> we, we call them seagoing bellhops, you know. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were Marines, were you? No. Army, it's all right. You're fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I got back to the fantail, and there was two kids leaning up against the bulkhead. One kid was bleeding really bad. His arm was all full. I gave him my life jacket and went back and got another one and came back to the fantail. How much time did you By just By that describe? time, I was walking on the bulkheads. Uh-huh. She was listening pretty bad. Wow. And I got to the lifeline, and there's a Frenchie was standing there. He said, you better get going, Bray. She's going down. I said, where am I going to go? You know? By that time, he left. I never saw him again. I climbed over the rail, and by that time, one of the screws was out of the water. She was still turning, and I ran up the side of the ship. She was laying on her side, and I got to the quarter deck, and I jumped off at the quarter deck. It was about 40 feet off the water. I hit the water, and somebody hit me, drove me down. I don't know how far I went down, but I opened my eyes, up on, and... Uh, the moon was out, and I could just I thought the ship was coming down on top of me, but it was an oil slick on the water. Oh, boy. So I got up through that, and I, I looked back, and she was up on her bow already going down. She was standing straight up and down, and there was guys still coming off uh, like a like ants on a stick, you know. Wow. They were, well, as a matter of fact— uh, And how far away from, from uh, you? Uh, about 100 yards. That was— oh. a, Okay. I didn't get it very far away. I yeah. want to ask you, time moves different. I, I'm a combat vet, too, and for me, combat t- 
time changes fast, slow, whatever that 12 minutes from boom to in, you know, gone. It, was it 30 seconds in real time for you or how yeah. much time did it feel I, like? I don't, I don't know. It didn't, it seemed longer. Okay. But, uh, it was just like, it got hit at like 12, 15, maybe, maybe yeah. before. And she was gone by, you know, 10, 12 minutes. She was gone under of course. The bow was gone. She sucked up all that water. Yeah. She, the, the bow was blown off. Matter of fact, when they found her, they found the bow first. It was about a mile away from the rest of the ship. You know, they found her, you know, two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That was a miracle they found her because she's down uh, 18,000 feet. Wow. <laughs> She's sitting yeah, in a, not she, far from the trench. She's sitting so. in a canyon. Uh-huh. I think I have it on tape, too, on, the, on there. If you want to see it later, I can show it to you. But, it's, it's, but what's surprising is how clear everything is so clean. There's no moss, no nothing on her. And the gun mounts, she's sitting straight up. The two forward mounts are gone. The two eight-inch mounts are gone. But the one on the fantail still, and they can't understand why, because they're not bolted down. They're on a, a on a gear, yeah. uh -huh. and they can't understand why the back one, the why fantail intact. stayed on. Wow. But there's a 40 millimeter mount and a couple of five inch mounts you can see on the fantail. They found the plane also that was on the ship, correct? Well, they found a wing, I think. Okay. But you know what? I don't remember the airplane being on her that day or on that trip. I don't remember seeing them, but the, the guys, because when I got on the quarter deck after we got hit, the, the whole, whole uh, where the plane was supposed to be was full of guys, uh, wounded and crying and screaming, and, and I didn't see an airplane that time. And they said one was on a catapult. I didn't see that one either. So I don't know. I wasn't that observant or what, but I didn't. I didn't see it at all. Any of the planes on the night we got hit. Wow. So to pick up where you left off, you're in the water, and it's yeah, you well, and a I bunch hit, of diesel oil. Well, I, when I hit the water, I, I surfaced and, uh, of course, got oil and crap in my eyes and face and mouth and everything. But there was a, a raft with one. Uh, a, was a another raft, but a net floating with a guy sitting on top of it. So I went, I swam to it, and we got it unrolled, and it rolled out to about, about 40 feet square. It was a floater net. Wow. And so we start picking up guys, uh, and uh, we counted off. The next morning, we had picked up 151 guys, just our group. That's a big uh, group. That's yeah. almost half of... Uh, of, uh, yeah, it was about half of the survivors. Yeah. But depending on where you went off and when you went off, is we got separated in the water. Sure. Uh, there was and probably hundreds of yards apart. Oh, yeah. There was, uh, I don't know, uh, some guys went off early. And uh, I, I don't know. The, the, the skipper had, I think he ended up with four rafts and nine guys. I guess, I don't know where he went off, or he just floated off. I don't I don't understand how he got off the ship, but but a lot of guys just jumped off early, and we're spread out all over the place. Wow. Uh, so and, uh, when you were out, out there, uh, how did you? You were in a group, so you slept in shifts, or because you were I out there for you four slept days. When you, I don't ever remember sleeping, but I guess I did in five days. What happened to me, I met this older sailor. I never saw him on a ship. His name is Pappy Goff. He died here oh, three years ago. He lived to be 102 years old. Wow. But he, he some way, some way, he latched on to me and told me what to do and what not to do. He was, he was like 20 years older than me. And so I think that saved my ass a lot of times. I, in, the, in the night, I'd get on, on the net. So I wouldn't, if I fell asleep, I wouldn't float away. In the daytime, I'd hung out around the edge because the guys were second and third day, they start going nuts and fighting and, and you know, so you're just trying to separate yourself each from each other. So I stay as far as away from them. 
Yeah. And Pappy did the same thing. And we were. Thanks, Pappy. Uh, yeah. Pappy Golf. So when you're out there in the uh, in the water, over the course of a few days, uh, things change. Human dynamics change. People. Oh yeah. yeah, every day was different. The guys were drinking the salt water, going nuts. Oh man. They're, you you can't imagine. Uh, uh, the last guy that I seen come by me one day, maybe the fourth day, and he. It turned out to be a half a guy, but he came flying in, in, in front of me. And he was, looked like he was smiling, but his face was all swollen. His tongue was swollen. He, he couldn't, I, I, he was dead. I know he was dead. We, I pulled him in and tried to tie him to the, the net, but I guess I didn't tie he, he was gone, but he looked like he was, legs were gone Seven or something. Half. He must have been hit by sharks or something. But, wow. But uh, a lot of guys were hit by sharks. Huh? Oh yeah, yeah. We, I mean, they never bothered me much. But didn't like the smell. Of, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you go into the water, I mean, everybody's in some. Nobody's ready to be yeah. in the ocean. So people are hungry. They're yeah. oh, you know yeah. working on whatever. They're playing cards. What What was your state? I mean, obviously you were sleeping, but were you well fed? Were you feeling like I was just uniquely prepared for this? Unpreparable uh, I, thing. Or? I didn't know what was happening because when when they knocked me off the ledge, I looked up and the fire coming out of number one. And mm. I, was, I was getting showered by hot steel. I got my arm was all burned with the hot steels, and that's the only injury I had. Uh, I didn't get hurt at all. It was, uh, well, you held up pretty good. Yeah. It's worth noting that you uh, enlisted. You talked to your your mom and dad into signing you. My in. dad, yeah. And I think you want to get rid of me, so he's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you you talked your dad into signing you yeah. in. Your mom I was too uh, wild about the idea. I was a senior in high school. Uh huh. Where'd you in high school? Uh, half my year was gone, and all my buddies were enlisting or being drafted. I said I might be listening. I may be missing something here. Uh huh. So I talked my dad a party into, out there. <laughs> so my two other buddies said, "Yeah, let's go enlist." So. One didn't have a, a father, so my dad signed him in too. Wow! But he made it to, to a boot camp with me, but he disappeared some night. He couldn't grasp it. I guess he might have shipped him back home. He couldn't. He couldn't. Uh, how do you say? He couldn't get involved. He couldn't. He couldn't learn the manual arms. He was kind of dense, I guess. I don't. Yeah. Anyhow, they got rid of him, and the other guy got back on a medical. And they left me there by myself, but that was better that way than anyhow. But wow! So you went in when you were seventeen years old, yeah. and then the your first deployment on a, on a ship was on the Indianapolis. Yes, and the last one, yeah. and the last, <laughs> which which really is is remarkable. Uh, yeah, because you were the you are the youngest survivor. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So now take us through the. Uh, you were picked up on the – you guys we were get, sighted on the fourth Before we day. get picked up, yeah, yeah. I, I want to ask, how do you spend the time in the water? I mean, how do you occupy your mind? Well, just just staying, staying away from the other guys. I knew enough to do that uh, because I didn't know anybody on a ship. Because you were new. I was brand new. Yeah. I went on with 12 other guys out of my company, and none of them were in the water with me. Matter of fact, I don't think any of them made it out alive. Wow. Of the 12 guys that I uh, got on with, wow. I think they all got killed or that night or, or died in the water. Well, you guys reunite uh, at least once a year, right? Yeah, we so, still yeah. So if they, they just had, got a probably notice would have known. The dates on, a, on, the, uh, on, the, uni- on the anniversary, well, it would be on, in July, of course, mm-hmm. four days in July, uh, I think it's the 18th through the 22nd or something this year. Oh, so you get together for all four days. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, there's only – then I got a notice one guy died last week. He was 96. Oh. He was probably the oldest of the survivors, and he died there two or three days ago, I guess. But there's 13 of us left, the survivors. I want to tell our listeners that uh, you are 92 years old. 
Is that right? I'm 91 now. 91. 91. If you are listening on the, on the iPhone podcast app and you have not looked at a website picture of Harold Bray, you don't want to mess with him. <laughs> He's 91 years old. You don't want to mess with him. You know, at, at one of the reunions, uh, the guy that was painting this picture here, uh-huh. I walked up to him. He says, uh, was your dad on the Indianapolis? <laughs> yeah. <I'd>, uh, <laughs> Speaking of dads, uh, uh, I married a young lady named Christy Brinkerhoff, uh, yeah. and she said to tell you hi. You were uh, friends with my my father in law, Dell. You guys work at the golf course together. Do you last remember name? Dell Brinkerhoff? He lived oh the yeah, corner. yeah, yeah, Dell. Yeah, he died. Uh, Dell's dead. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. I worked with Dell for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was kind enough to let me marry his daughter, and she said oh, hello. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about him. He's just... He's kind of a grepo part. Yeah, he was. <laughs> that was part of his charm. <laughs> so getting back to uh, your experience in the water, you're occupying your time and really getting away with it partially because you didn't know anybody. Yeah. So that allowed you to escape the mix. And uh, a lot of the guys uh, got messed up in the mix. What um, The mental undoing, some of that had to do with drinking the salt water, huh? Well... That's what kept me alive was not drinking at it or even you letting it in your eyes or anything mm-hmm. because it's poison, you know, mm-hmm. actually poison. Yeah. Uh, guys that drank it the second and third day, they just went nuts and either swam off or or died or, you know, it's a, it's a killer. I give all the credit in the world to Pappy for uh, keeping me uh, from any trouble. Yeah, I would uh, stay mostly by myself during the days, and of course, like I said, I'd get up on the net at night. So I, if I fell asleep, I wouldn't float away from the group. And uh, a lot of guys, that's how they disappeared. Uh, and of course, the sharks were busy all the time. But I had them. You could look. Down, we were in the water all the time. I yeah. mean, we were wet all the time. There was no getting out of the water. Uh, because all we had was a net to hang on to. Uh, and, of course, the guys were lucky enough to have uh, life jackets, but they were only good for 72 hours, right. and we were in the, in the water already 100 hours, you know. Uh, yeah, so those life jackets were getting yeah. waterlogged, and they were Yeah, they, could, they start pulling you down. Of course, they're full of oil, too. Mm-hmm. And they got, if you weren't hanging on the net, you were up to your chin in water, you know. Wow. But... Uh, how was your state of mind in terms of being rescued? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things out there. You guys had said you'd seen airplanes fly overhead. Every day, every day. Did you feel like, did you have hope, or was it just? Well, that's all you had. It was hope somebody else would come along. And But there was no, no ships. I never saw a ship the whole time we were out there. And uh, that morning, I, I, can't, I can't even describe when we saw that airplane in the horizon and he kept coming and coming he was low enough he's coming right at us and uh and according to the you know the pilot lived here in san jose for a long time he didn't died and we used to get all the information from him how, what happened and uh the only reason he ever saw us he was laying down one of the guys was laying down checking an, an antenna that broke on the airplane. And he was looking down, and it came over the oil slick, and he thought they had a Jap sub. So he, he opened up the bomb bay doors and was going to drop. The, he had the bomb and everything. But he came over us and had seen us in the oil, and we were screaming and hollering, of course. He couldn't hear us. but Anyhow, he went over us and gave us the wing thing, and he came back and did it again. Waved at you. Then, yeah, and then he went straight up. I could still see him going, I said, where the hell is he going? So he told us later that he had to go up to about 7,000 feet so he could radio. His radio were worked to the base. And that's, he radioed the base, ducks on the pond. Yeah. And that's when the rescue started. That but then there were a bunch we, of you floating around in the water. Pardon? That meant there were a bunch of you floating yeah. around on the water. Yeah, he didn't know what we, he didn't know if we were Japs or what, but he just said there were ducks on the pond, and that's the rescue started. And uh, 
I, the the PBY that came out, I never did see her. She landed in the water. Mm-hmm. She landed in another group. So that's we got separated pretty good in the water. Okay, the groups did and, and So the, the hundred and fifty of you that you gathered yeah, up to tides, begin with started I think to get They separated. say we drifted like two hundred miles or something wow. like that. Wow. Yeah, the the, the seaplane. Uh, Against all orders, landed in the in the water. Open ocean wasn't supposed to do it in open ocean. They picked up fifty one guys that night, the, the on, in the seaplane, but they couldn't take off. They Too many a, guys. Too much weight. Well, he he tied them on the wings and the pontoons, and yeah. it cracked the wings and pontoons. And, the and ship, I'm sure guys were saying, "Put me anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Strap me to whatever." Yeah, yeah. I'll see, hang I on. didn't see any of this at all. And and uh, when we got discovered. Uh, he'd start dropping stuff from the first airplane. Start dropping. He dropped uh, provisions. Uh, he dropped a couple of uh, life rafts, uh, rubber mm-hmm. ones. I didn't get to go get on one, but and then uh, dropped some like he, I think some guys got some cigarettes, but no matches. So they had to chew <laughs> the goddamn cigarettes. <laughs> but uh, he sat, dropped some kind of food too. I guess I didn't. Ever, at that span. time, I swam away from the group. Because he dropped something what looked like a tank of water. Oh yeah! Mm-hmm. So I swam. He hadn't had water in four no, days. No, I swam to it. Okay. Later, when I talked to the pilot, he said you could have pulled up the mic and talked to me. I said I didn't want to talk to you. I wanted to drink of water. So, <laughs> so I, it was no good to me. So there he, was a he guy. He dropped a radio. There, What'd you do with it? You just left it. Yeah, I just left it there. I didn't even. I just pulled it up and seen the mic. So it was a sub detector. Okay. So I swam. There was a, a raft with two guys on it, so I swam to it. And uh, it was just a ring. There was no deck to the raft at all. It was just a ring. And sometimes in the night, those guys disappeared. I happened, what happened to them? Unless they died or got hit by sharks or whatever. So this was the you, – you had been spotted – the rescue effort yeah. had begun. Yeah. It was. They were sending somebody for you, and during that time, the guys that were on the raft with you oh, yeah. disappeared. Yeah, there's guys, uh, they just... Uh, Kept dropping off. They were just so tired and... Uh, just couldn't take it anymore. Couldn't hang in there. My best, my best friend who uh, was in a different group, he was with five guys. They, were, they got on the airplane. Now, they swam towards the airplane, and there's five guys, four of them died on the way to the airplane. Oh, my gosh. And Dick's the only one that uh, survived that group. Uh, when, you, when you went on your swim for the the radio, Bucket of Water, uh, how were you in terms of energy? I mean, it's someone thing to say I swam there, but you hadn't eaten or had a drink uh, in four yeah, days. I, I don't know how I got there, but I, I, I don't know. I must have had enough strength to do it. Uh, I... I was just happy that I didn't have to go back to the group because they were going nuts over, probably fighting over the food that the guy was dropping or some. I'm just, I'm just lucky the other raft was there too. But I didn't like the idea of being left there by myself mm. because if I fell asleep, I would have been gone or two, you know. Yeah. Yep. Sometime during the night, uh, I was rescued the next day. I think I was. Uh, the first one picked up because I was on the outer ring of the rest of them. I think uh, the, it was still dark when I got picked up. They, they hit me with this spotlight because they didn't know what we were. And uh, the, the Higgins boat come up and uh, they threw a ladder over the side and said, asked me, who, we, who are you? I told them, Indianapolis. And, uh, it's, it's Indianapolis was sunk. They, nobody knew it. Nobody knew it. And so he threw a ladder over the side. He's, so he said, hell yeah, I can climb. I couldn't even lift my arm out of the water. <laughs> so two guys got in the water, got me out, and put me in one of those basket things. And they took me back to the basset. I think, I don't remember picking up anybody else that, with me. And they put me... Uh, Oh, you were way on the outskirts. Yeah. And then she, they put me on the basset. The, the ocean was really rough, as I remember, that night. And the, the Higgins boat was bouncing up and down. The ship was bouncing. And, and the first thing, I, I was flying through the air. 
They <laughs> jerked me out of that guy. <laughs> and the next thing I know was laying on the deck of the Bassett. And that's all I remember for a couple of days. I woke up in somebody's bunk with clean clothes on. I was They cleaned the oil off me somehow. I don't remember how. But I woke up, some guy was cleaning my eyes, the oil out of my eyes. And I grabbed his arm. And I remember him saying, that's okay, sailor. And I went out again. I never woke up till we got to the Philippines a couple of days later. And we went to the hospital in the Philippines. Wow. Our group did it. Uh, the other groups, I forget, uh, I think. The, the groups got dispersed? They sent other guys yeah, other places? Yeah, got separated in the water. So mm. The when tides. You, when you were passed out on the ship, though, did they, did they give you an IV? How did they give uh, you nourishment? I, I don't remember getting any. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero, co-host of the Break It Down Show and fellow producer here at Lions Rock Productions. And I'm proud to announce our newest show. It's called Justice. Season one is going to be a deep dive into some of the cases I personally worked on as a licensed private investigator. And you'll get a unique view into the criminal justice system that may just challenge some of your personal notions about how it should work and open your eyes in ways you never imagined. So keep your ears open for Justice, a brand new podcast from Lions Rock Productions to iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Did they give you an IV? How did they give you uh, nourishment? I don't remember getting any. Um, they tried to give us some juice. Okay. Because uh, they were smart enough to not to pour water on us, I guess. Yeah. Because that would have killed us all. But uh, I I think uh, when I woke up there a couple of days, I, I had some juice. And we didn't have anything else till we got to the hospital in the Philippines, which was a couple of days more. Because they couldn't. We couldn't take in any food, I guess. I lost 35 pounds in the water. Wow. That's good. Like four four days. Days. I know. That's what we need to do. <laughs> we need to go float around the water for four days. Uh, I don't give recommend you some that diet. But oh, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you don't recall anything other than juice, but did they give you an IV? I mean, I don't know. I can't remember doing anything like that. That's what you'd want to do right away now is like put I it, don't you know, think they had very equipped for right. that on the ship's. Because the ship that we were picked up by was a demolition transport. Oh, right. Okay. It was a marine ship that took marines into the beaches. Uh-huh. And uh, it was a, the Bassett was the name of the ship that to, to picked me up. So you, got, you must have lost sailors after you had been, they quote, did. unquote, rescued. There, there was yeah. four or five died after we got picked up. Mm. They were in pretty bad shape. Yeah. I don't know what... Uh, I'm just an old country boy. I guess I was in pretty good shape. I, yeah. So I mean, you survived a massive tragedy. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it because you, a lot of it because you separated from everybody else. Yeah. Probably kept my to myself most of the time, except for Pappy, and uh, we we remained friends forever. Uh, he would come to the reunions, mm-hmm. and we just hang together. Then then uh, Pappy died. Oh, he's been about five years ago now. He's been gone. Wow. But uh, give me, he kept me alive. Thanks, Pappy. Yeah. yeah. That guy must have been, you know, just a, he learned all the ways of the ship and just understood what to do and the, yeah. all the situations. And you were lucky enough to have fallen off that, yeah. that I ship. I don't know why he picked right me. Near him. I don't know why he picked me. Uh, I never Cause, saw cause him on the ship. Because you looked like you were going to make it. Yeah. I'll go with that. I'm glad he did, but uh, sure. I always wondered why why he uh, even latched on to me, because I was, I didn't know anybody. Mm-hmm. On, I, you know, if I did, I didn't recognize him in the water. Anyhow, yeah. you were covered with oil, yeah. and you wouldn't know your own brother next to you. But it was that uh, that thick bunker oil. Yeah, and, uh, it was all over you. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. How long did it take to get? So when I would be in combat i would come home and physically i'm home uh, but about eh, seven to ten days before like i really started to arrive and then a couple of months before like emotionally i yeah. was just home yeah how long did it take for you to all the way get out of the water where it wasn't any part of who you yeah, were i'll anymore? tell you what every day i think about something mm. that happened out there or there's not a day that i don't go by that uh, something triggers something and i uh, think about it 
Yeah. I have a lot of nightmares. I had, but I haven't had, I haven't knocked my wife out of bed very recently, but <laughs> <laughs> she's been dodging me for a long time. <laughs> so I've got a question. How, how many lost their lives? We lost 880 guys. Out of how many? Uh, 1,100. And how many are surviving now? 13 of us. So my question to you is, you ever ask yourself, why me? Yeah, I, every day. Every day. Yeah. yeah. And have you, ever, have you ever come to a reason? No, it's just, I don't know why. I was just in better shape than a lot of the guys, I guess. And young enough to, to uh, but, uh, you know, there was a lot of young 17-year-olds on that ship and went on with me. There, there was even three sets of twins, hmm. and they never made it, though. They didn't. None of them made it. Wow. Uh, so I don't know why me. That's right. Why me? I don't know why. I just think there's there's always a purpose yeah. for something that we go through. And I just I just believe that God divinely had his hand upon your life. I don't know. I haven't been too good to him, though. So. That doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> just a question. Just a question. Yeah. So your uh, return... Uh, to the Bay Area came eventually, but first, when you left the Philippines, uh, they gave you a little bit of time off. Yeah, we went. Well, we ended up in Guam. Okay, that's a good hospital. place to take, take some time off. If you ask me. But we were in hospital eighteen. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe not in the hospital. <laughs> we went to hospital, and then we went to the rest camp. Uh huh. Uh, submarine rest camp there, and we were there. I don't know, two or three weeks. Okay. And then we went. All got on the uh, aircraft carrier Hollandia. Mm-hmm. We went home together, everybody, except some some of the guys were too sick to be moved yet. So they, I guess they stayed in Guam for I don't know how long. But anyhow, we uh, ended up in uh, San Diego. Okay. But we still didn't have any clothes. We, we I had borrowed. You were in hospital gowns. Yeah. I had uh, somebody's, uh, with the column in the Navy, uh, Jeans or Tungaries? Tungaries. Tungaries, yeah. I had once uh, that what I was wearing, and then we got to the San Diego base, and they uh, started issuing us uniforms, but they, some were too big, some were too small. They set us out in San Diego, and we're being picked up by the SPs for being out of uniform. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so we finally got uh, that straightened out, and they, we got... Uh, uh, 30, 36 day survivor leave, and I went home. I lived in Upper Michigan at the time. Oh, you're a Uper. Oh yeah. Huh. Born and raised there. The, my assignment. They let us choose where we want to be stationed after that. And my buddy Ray uh, lived in Detroit, and there was a little air base outside of Detroit, Navy Air, and we chose. To go there, we had a maid for another year and a half. It was great. We, uh, I, I stayed in the Navy another year and a half after that and uh, got out. Around Detroit. Yeah. I got to give a shout out to uh, a listener who lives up there. Paul Colomb lives in Houghton Hancock. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's our listener in the UP. That's a that's We south might have a couple of, of them. But. Houghton's about south of where I was. Oh, south. <laughs> <laughs> I was up in. Uh, you were even more robust. Lake Superior. Lake Superior. I was right on the Wisconsin border. Uh huh. Hurley, Wisconsin, Ironwood, Michigan, right there. Did some ice fishing? Yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, I had a place on Lake Ogibic. Okay. I had uh, like 20 acres there, and, uh, and we used to fish for walleyes and. Uh, Pick roll and All but right. I only lasted a very short time after I got out, and uh, I I wasn't going into mines. My dad worked at iron ore iron mines. That's all that was up there was iron ore mines. Yeah. So I I told my mom and dad I said uh, I'm I'm out of here. You I'm guys want to go? You better be in the car. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I had a sister up in Washington State. I went up there first, and uh, I worked at Bethlehem Steel for about three months. It got way too wet. You had enough of that. <laughs> I had a sister living here in Benicia. All right. And she came up 
to us for Christmas because I'm going home with you. Yeah. So I've been here ever since. No kidding. And what I, year was that? 1948. Wow. New Year's Day, 48, I was here. Wow. Yeah. And apparently yeah. it's stuck. Yeah. And you're, and you're old school, Benicia, because you say Benicia. Yeah. yeah. And we like that. Not only that, but uh, we, we have to acknowledge that uh, Harold Bray spent 23 years on the Benicia Police Force. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That was my that was my uh, ambition. I chose that when I was in eighth grade. Either that or uh, a truck driver, cross country truck driver. Mm. Well, I did a little bit of that in the Navy. Uh, we used to haul when I was stationed in Detroit. We used to we dismantle a base in in, in uh, Indiana, so we got the convoy back and forth. But anyhow, I worked for the government at the arsenal for about thirteen years. And I, I got on a reserve police here. What year was that? 58, 59. Okay. And then I got on the regulars, 59 or 60. Yeah, 90, I don't, one of those two years, anyhow. So I owe you no apologies then. Yes. How about you, Kurt? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying to think where the police station was because my dad graduated from Benicia High in 1953. Uh, where the police station is now. That was Benicia High School. Yeah, well, it, uh, when I went on board, we, were, we had a station downtown. Of, uh, it's a restaurant today. That's right. That's it's right, right there on D, no, no, D Street, yeah, D Street yeah. right there on the corner. Yeah. Mm. We went from there to, uh, remember, Winners and Winners? Mm-hmm. We, had a, we had a station there. Then Up we there went, by then went over to the high school. Yeah. From the, Boy, you saw a lot of evolution in this small town. I tell you, we straightened it out. Though. It was just a fishing. It was just, <laughs> you. You just had work to do in a fishing village. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah there, when I went on board, there was only six of us. Wow. We had to. We we. You had to Rochambeau for who got to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. We had. Do you remember uh, any of the guys? The old guys. Uh, Bill. Uh, he's old Indian. Hmm. Mm-mm. He used to. Be, I don't know if you guys were. We still had meters on the first street. Wow! Mm-hmm. And he, Bill uh, Madden, was his name. He's mm. an Indian. Uh huh. I suppose he used to make shifts. the revenue, huh? Oh, it's just, <laughs> that guy was too much. We we had pull shifts together, and we'd take turns dispatching and in patrol. Okay. So take turns dispatching. Yeah, <laughs> we had to go dispatch one night. He, he Did you ever have to dispatch yourself? Like, like uh, Bray, yeah, yeah. take this call. You're like, I'll I be, better I'll go. Be right no, out there. Bill lived, Bill lived about a block away from the PD. Mm. So he, he says, I'm going to go home for lunch tonight. Okay. So he takes the car, goes back, goes home. And I'm waiting and waiting. I get a couple calls. Hey, Bill, you got to. His wife had to the phone. I said, where's Bill? He said, oh, he's in bed. He went, to, he went to sleep. I said, you get his ass up. He got to go. Said, he pulled that shit so much on me. <laughs> so you you were right then in the action when the Zodiac Killer killed oh, the yeah. people. I oh. rode, matter of fact, I rode the school bus because he threatened to blow up the school bus. Right. I rode, I rode to, to, we picked up kids at Mare Island mm-hmm. for the for the. A Catholic school. Yeah. So I rode that bus several times. Did you do the call out to Lake Herman Road? Or was that all Vallejo PD that went out there? No, that's well, kind of... Gate yeah, 13 was ours. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the guy died in prison or something. He never never did find him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was kind of exciting for a while. Yeah, we were in the national spotlight for a moment. Yeah. Wow. I just have one more question. And again... Because I, I see life through the combat lens, kind of like you were going to do it. I always think to myself, no one's trying to shoot at me today. Hey, whatever is happening is all golden for yeah. me, right? Do you have that? You're like, I'm not floating around in an ocean, so yeah. it's all good. Yeah, no, I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't remember much of uh, the memories of, I remember being out there, but I don't remember ever thinking that I was going to die, you know. But you don't die at 17, 18 years old. Yeah. But the kids were dying all around me. Uh, but they were drinking the water and, and fighting each other. So, you know, wasting all that energy. And I don't know. I can't tell you why I didn't do stuff like that. Did it change your outlook on life? Yeah. 
I guess. Oh, it does. Yeah, you appreciate what you have today <laughs> or any time, you know. It's a... Uh, it's uh, something that I can't even tell you how bad it was out there, you know. Yeah. I couldn't e- explain how, how it was on on uh, on your body alone. Right. Anything you touched after the third day, the skin would roll off. You're just uh-huh. rotting away. Yeah. Uh, the whole my whole body is just new skin. It just peeled right off, you know. After the third fourth day, anything you touched. Anything you touch, your skin would roll off. Yeah, it was just, I couldn't. It was, I tried to get my my life jacket off, and I couldn't untie the knots because of my uh, mm, fingers wow. wouldn't work. You it's, had this experience at age seventeen, and it really has made the course of your life a uh, lot different. And and I, you know, yeah. can. Uh, and, uh, really think about how you appreciate life differently, but you've also had to tell this story probably ten thousand times, and we sure are glad that you're telling it with us tonight. I just I just did it up at uh, Beale Air Force Base I, uh-huh. last two weeks ago. I did it up there uh, with a bunch of Sea Scouts. Wow! Yeah, boy, you fixed their little red wagon, huh? Yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Said seven. How old are you? He said thirteen, fourteen. I said oh, four more years. You could go in the navy. Yeah. Said, Can you oh. swim? <laughs> has it been a? Uh, how do I put? Has it been a pain in the ass having to tell this story so many times no, throughout your you life? You know, at first, I I think it's none of your business. You know. Yeah. But after uh, the story had to be told, uh, and it is still does. People are still wanting. Uh, matter of fact, yesterday a guy knocked on my door. He had one of our books mm-hmm. in his hand. I don't know how he knew where I live, but uh, he he lives here in Benicia. He just wanted me to autograph the book. Yeah, I do that quite often. As far as uh, the two girls that wrote the last book, were, uh, we usually meet up and. Uh, we were at the uh, the aircraft carrier down in Alameda. The Hornet. We did that a couple of weeks ago. We had Lynn Vincent on the show yeah. a while back. Yeah, yeah, she was on already, too. Yeah. yeah. I don't mind doing it anymore. It's, uh, it's, it's sort of a relief for me, you know, to release that. But uh, like I said, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I would never, ever tell that went on up there is is a, something that normal people would never see. You know? Right. And they wouldn't understand anyhow if I tried to tell them. I told my father-in-law about your story. He just passed away uh, um, uh, Martin Luther King Day. Oh, yeah. And uh, he was a master chief uh, yeah. on the Navy for 21 years. Oh, yeah. And one of his ships was the USS Pyro. Oh, yeah. He made master chief in 20 years. That's pretty good. Yeah. He was a career man. And yeah. it was it's hard for him to tell stories yeah. of what went on yeah. out there at sea. Well, the thing is, uh, people just would not understand uh, if I elaborated on what happened out there. It wouldn't even sink in. It wouldn't be. Yeah. It wouldn't know what I was talking about even. Yeah. Everything uh, in that world is different than yeah, this world. Yeah. The right. ethics are different. It's, it's not a real world. It's actually. not. Uh, no, it's a temporary weird yeah. world. Yeah. I never told my kids about this. Uh, I guess they were in high school before they knew uh, that I was ever on that ship. My mother and dad died not ever knowing about it. I never told them about it. Let that sink in for just a second. You never told your mom and dad. No, never did. Wow. No. And it wasn't. Wow. I mean, at the time we were at war, so it almost wasn't. There were plenty of things to see, and it was there was plenty of news yeah. around that you could just let it get buried. They probably didn't even know I was on a ship. Wow. I I didn't write very home very often. Yeah. I mean, matter of fact, I was in hospital. You couldn't tell your mom you'd got your dad in trouble. Yeah. I was in <laughs> hospital in Guam. 
and the, and the, uh, what do you call the minister on the Navy? Uh, Japlin. Japlin come by and said, Harold oh, Bray, you better write home. I guess somehow he got the letter that, that I, where I, where was I? Ah, so he got wind of the fact that you weren't writing yeah. home. So I, I wrote home and told him where. Matter of fact, my uncle was a Marine on Okinawa. And on the way home, he found me in the hospital on the Guam. I don't know how he ever did that. He walked in the ward. I was laying in a bunk. And we both bald like kids. You know, there was something else. Wow. Yeah. He was just got up. Uh, the... Uh, the war was over, and he was on his way home. And he, I don't know how he found out I was in the hospital on Guam. And somehow he found me in the in the ward there. Terrific. Uh, I took him to the chow hall and fed him. He hadn't eaten in real food for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to point our listeners to ussindianapolis.org, where you can read the details of the story. Uh, you can also read about the organization that uh, keeps the guys reuniting the survivors uh, reunite every year yeah. to uh to get together for the 4 days of the year that they spent floating around in the water um I also want to uh point to the fact that you uh let's see you were you the chairman of this organization I am chairman You are chairman yeah. now Nobody okay. else wanted it, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the youngest, so yeah. it's time for you to take you're the mantle. Finally, away. in command. <laughs> Way to go, Bray. Yeah. Well, there's lots to read on that website, and I encourage everybody to do it. And I will say that uh, I can't thank you enough for you know the sacrifice that you uh, that you endured over there, and the fact that you've sacrificed by enduring telling this story so many darn times yeah. because it captivates all yeah. of us. Yeah, I don't mind doing it anymore. It's just. It's okay. Well, you've led a life of service, and uh, and we appreciate it. Uh, our guest today, everybody, is Harold Bray, and uh, we celebrate you around here. And I uh, hope everybody of the 13 survivors around uh, the country, uh, wherever they are, everybody ought to celebrate them. Uh, but we got the youngest one here. We got the young buck, yeah, the, the chairman. Only, the other, the last reunion, there was only three of us at the reunion. Oh, boy. The other guys can't travel anymore. Yeah. We had, do have one Marine, though. Okay. And he's not, I think uh, Ed's 94, 95 years old. One of the 37 made it. Yeah. Well, where's, he, he, where's he at in the country? He's in uh, Tennessee. All right. He's and on the man, list. We this guy, you got to hear him yeah. speak. This yeah. guy can speak. All I mean, right. he got a voice to speak. I just <laughs> was in Florida with him, him and uh, Dick Thielen, who is the uh, other survivor from Lansing, Michigan. Ah, him and I were in boot camp together. Two uh, Michiganders. You guys came through Great Lakes, I, know, I imagine. Had, yeah, we had to stick together. Yeah. <laughs> wow. We weren't in the same company, uh, but we were in boot camp at the same time. We went on a ship the same day. Yeah. And we were buddies ever since. Ever since. Yeah. He's older than me, three months. <laughs> <laughs> Just barely. <laughs> I always I have the needle for that, you know. He's the old guy. Yeah, yeah. you get to rub that in. Yeah. Uh, if you go to ussindianapolis.org, you're going to read the story of Captain McVeigh as well. Yeah. Uh, he actually, Captain Charles was, Butler McVeigh III, uh, was court-martialed that was stupid. for failing to zigzag. Yeah, that was stupid. That was. That, yeah. was a, that was a big political thing within the Navy. The story goes that McVeigh's dad was an admiral, and he chastised this uh, was a ensign at the time, mm -hmm. and he got to be I can't remember the guy's name Steph would know. He got to be uh, in command of the South Pacific, and that's how this court martial came about. Oh come on! Yeah, it was a it was a thing that this guy had against McVeigh. Dad, because his dad, yeah, because his dad. So and uh, Took that's it out how that came about. That's terrible. I didn't get to go to the court martial. Uh, several of the guys that were on watches went to the court martial. Uh -huh. I was due to go on watch four o'clock the next morning, but we got hit about one o'clock, so I didn't get to go. That's where the story is. Uh, the guys that were on watches got to, to go to this court martial. And that was that was a 
really a sad thing what they did to McVeigh. Thank you so much for everything you've done and your time and no keep doing it. It's it's incredible. Like John said, you're an American treasure and, and we really appreciate your time. Yeah. Harold Gray, everybody.